So now we are moving on to Unit 3 um, in the green booklet. It's uh, questions 10 to 13. And here comes a question type that is comes up on the exam quite op often. Um, and some students struggle with it, but I promise you the concepts are very basic and straightforward. First of all, one of the problems that some students have is they see a stretcher or a bed and they have been told or described that uh, these are torque force problems. So they're starting to get that pattern recognition and, and looking for it, but there's always that feeling of why is this a torque force? Because torque forces are turning forces. You know, it's the, it's the force supply times the perpendicular distance from the pivot point. So torque forces are turning forces. So why on earth do we have torque forces when somebody's lying in a bed? <laughs> you know, when someone's uh, just resting or relaxing, nothing's turning, nothing's twisting, but we use this. And the truth is it's because it makes problem solving easier. And there's many things that we do in physics that it just makes problem solving easier. And that's, that's why you end up uh, using it. So anyway, um, one thing is to recognize this problem type. The other thing is to apply the two concepts that solve all tor torque force problems. There's uh, all torque force problems that you will have. <laughs> um, and uh, the first issue is translational equilibrium. Translational equilibrium um, says that uh, all the, uh, if you sum all the upward forces, it will equal um, the sum of all the uh, downward forces. And likewise, if you sum all the forces uh, to the left, um, that will equal all the uh, forces going uh, to the right. So basically, if the thing is not accelerating, if it's not, uh, uh, if it's not accelerating, that means it's in some equilibrium. It's either not moving or it's moving at constant velocity. But in this case, there is no net force in any direction. And that's what translational equilibrium uh, is saying. You know, this is a consequence of Newton's second law, which is sum of forces is equal to mass times acceleration. And one way of thinking of it is that if there is a net force on anything, there must be acceleration. Not just movement, not just speed, but acceleration, any net force uh, uh, on an object. Okay, so uh, keeping in mind these two things, um, just looking at the passage, um, so it says uh, from a previous determination that the mass of the bed and the bedding is 90 kilograms, so we'll keep that in mind, and um, assume the bed is stationary, okay, so it's obviously in equilibrium, and acceleration due to gravity will be taking as 10 meters per second squared, so we'll be estimated. So the, um, uh, we're looking at something that, that looks like this, okay, and um, we have we have some sort of uh, the bed has the um, the legs here and uh, the 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 legs are going to apply some force of course because you know it, it's touching the ground um, so the, the there's going to be some force down and the ground is going to have to push back up so that's Newton's um, third law and this is um, action reaction so uh, every every force is going to have an equal and opposite uh, force so sometimes this force on the ground okay uh, sometimes that force on the ground is called the ground reaction force and that's going to go opposite to the um, force going down and uh, we're being told that uh, that one of the legs is uh, 700 newtons Okay, and the other one, uh, the one at X, see, one at X here is 700 newtons, and the one over Y is 800 newtons. So if you if you had a scale here, uh, so you have seven. I'm just going to write 700 newtons here, and 800 newtons here. So we have a total of 1500 newtons that is going down. So the question is. What is the total force exerted by the floor on the bed? If we have 1,500 newtons of force going down, then we have to have exactly, action, reaction, we have to have exactly 1,500 newtons of force going up. If we had even one newton of force extra, if it was 1,501 newtons, 
the person would lie down and then accelerate upwards, which is impossible, you know? So, and, and if the, the floor was not pushing up with exactly 1500 newtons, the person would accelerate downwards because there would be a net force downwards and force is mass times acceleration, Newton's second law. So if there's 1500 newtons down, there's exactly 1500 newtons up. And if you really, really wanted to do the physics on it, you'd, uh, but you would be wasting your time, but you'd, you'd say, you'd say sum, sum of forces is equal to mass times acceleration. You'd say that it's not accelerating, okay? Um, so the acceleration is zero. And then you would say the downward force is the weight mg and the upward force opposite direction would be the force normal. And so you would have mg minus n is equal to zero. Then you would have n, the force normal, is equal to the weight mg. So that is the force normal is equal to the uh, weight. Okay, so... Next, uh, so that means uh, question uh, 10, the answer would be 1500 newtons. And now we look at this next question 11. <clears throat> so we know that we have 1500 newtons down. That is the, uh, the total force down. So we can, we can um, we look, they're asking what is the mass of the patient? Well, if we know that the total force down is 1500 newtons, and this is the weight, mg because that is the force that is uh, that is being applied down well g is 10 10 meters per second squared so we have 10 on both a, a zero here and a zero there so that means the mass is 150 kilograms so we know that the total mass of this system is 150 kilograms and we were told that the mass of the bed and the bedding is 90 kilograms which would mean that the mass of the uh, person must be 60 kilograms. So uh, that would be answer choice B, 11. Now for 12. So here uh, we can think I'll just uh, take a little different color marker so it'll be a little easier on your eyes. So here we have, we know that we have 800 newtons uh, downwards. That means that at Y, Y has to push up with exactly 800 newtons of force in order for this not to collapse. On this side at X, X has to push up with exactly um, 700 newtons of force in order for the bed not to collapse. And finally, we know somewhere here um, there's going to be a force of 1500 newtons um, acting straight down. Now, if this was a uniform bed with a uniform weight, <clears throat> then we would say that the 1500 newtons acts exactly at the center of this, uh, um, well, you can call it a plank, but it's a bed or, or, or whatever. So, but we really don't know where this is, where the center of mass is, and, and this is the essential question that's being asked, <clears throat> is where is the center of mass? But even more so, they're not just asking you that, they're, they're asking where is the mass, um, uh, the center of mass, compared to why? So it's, it's really, it's, it's this distance that they are asking for. And what you do know is you do know the distance from x to y, and from x to y, I'm just going to add this up here, uh, from x to y, we know that the distance is L. So I don't know what this is, but I'm going to call it alpha L, which is some fraction of L. So I'm going to call this alpha L, and that's the distance from y to the center of mass. Now we come to the second rule uh, that you need to know that solves all um, torque forces. The first rule is the idea of translational equilibrium, that all upward forces equal all downward forces, and we use that already. Now we're going to uh, use um, rotational equilibrium. <clears throat> and so for rotational equilibrium, rotational equilibrium, we have the sum of clockwise torque forces 
is equal to the sum of counterclockwise torque forces. And keep in mind, a torque force is the force applied times the perpendicular distance to the pivot point. Now you may look at this and say, what do you mean pivot point? <laughs> Where's the pivot? There's nothing that's moving here. But we imagine a pivot point. We choose a pivot point. You can choose any single point here and you can solve the problem. But it would be very inefficient <laughs> if you chose randomly. You, ideally, you choose a pivot point um, that either uh, removes an unknown value uh, or a pivot point that is going to be the point from which you are measuring. Clearly, I would not choose uh, x as a pivot point because I'm not measuring from x, I'm measuring from y. So, so I have already two measurements from y, so this would be a better pivot point. And I also know that at the pivot point, my torque force is zero. Now you might wonder, well, what's, what's, what's that all about? Well, I want you to imagine you are, um, you go to the shopping mall and you see one of those doors, the, you know, the, you, the revolving doors, glass doors. Could you imagine somebody who um, enters one of those revolving doors and then starts to put their hand and applies pressure at the pivot point, which is the point about which the door turns? You know what would happen? Nothing. The door can't turn if you apply pressure at the pivot point. You can put all the force in the world at the pivot point. It won't turn. But if you start moving your hand away from the pivot point and start applying pressure, it becomes easier and easier to turn the door around because your torque force continually multiplies. You can apply the same force at differing distances and your torque force continues to multiply. So the, the force at the pivot point is zero no matter how much force there is there. So here's our pivot point. We're gonna take this as our pivot point. And so we're gonna look for the clockwise torque force and the counterclockwise torque force, and we're going to equate them. This will let us find out exactly what the fraction is in terms of the length uh, of the center of mass of the system. So, um, First, I will look at the clockwise torque force. So this is how you do it. You imagine that this is the center of the clock. So here's the center of the clock, and you think about how a clock turns clockwise. So a clock would turn clockwise for me in this direction, with this as the center of the clock. It would turn the same way for you as well. So um, I'm looking at this, and I'm looking for any vectors that I have that are moving in this direction. So I'm going around and around, and the only vector I have moving in this direction is this vector over here. See how it is moving in the clockwise direction. Notice how this vector here is moving opposite to the, my movement of a clock. So my clockwise torque force is going to be over here, which is uh, 700 newtons. So we have 700 newtons, and it's times L, because a torque force is the force applied times the distance to the uh, pivot point, and that's our pivot. Now we sum the counterclockwise torque forces. This is the counterclockwise direction. There's only one force moving in this direction. The counterclockwise torque force is the 1500 newtons times alpha L, alpha L. Now I know you might, while I was doing clockwise and counterclockwise, you might have been saying, hey, how come he's not including the Y? But I've said already, the force applied at the pivot point is zero. You completely ignore any force applied at the pivot point. So now we have this equation. We have our L's that cancel. We have a couple of zeros uh, that cancel. And then we have 7 over 15 is equal to alpha. Simple application of two rules can solve any torque force problems that they give you. The only thing that I would uh, try to uh, warn you about is that these vectors are all going perpendicular to the distance. 
So they follow the definition exactly. Sometimes um, in the exam, they'll have vectors that go at different directions. So you are expected to know sine theta, cosine theta, tangent theta, Saka Toa, whatever way that you like to memorize that information. You can go to the website and you can look and uh, I've put a f physics um, equation list where you can uh, look at all the equations that you need to know. Um, so all these things are, are, are good, but you know, the other thing that happens too is that sometimes what Acer will do is they will give you some symbols to represent uh, the vertical component or the horizontal component of those vectors. But anyway, this is one of their problems. It's a classic and I, I hope you understood it. And uh, if you have the book, you can look in uh, Physics uh, 4.1 for uh, more information about, um, about uh, torque forces. Oh, there's one more question here. Oh, but it's too easy. <laughs> so, um, so the, the, you know, some blah, blah, blah about the nurse reweighing and uh, so on. And uh, in this case, um, how, what would the readings on the scales show at X and at Y? Well, we've already been told that the downward force at x is 700 newtons and i've already explained that because of uh, newton's uh, third law that means that the upward force here has to be exactly equal to 700 newtons and here exactly equal to 800 newtons in order to be a counteracting force um and so on so that means and furthermore um in a in a question that i, I did in one of the videos uh, about um about um, an elevator problem and a person standing on an elevator um, uh, what we concluded was that when a person is on a scale the scale reads force normal the scale reads force normal because what does a scale do you stand on it and it pushes up with a certain force counteracting force you're not accelerating upwards <laughs> you're staying uh, in equilibrium but it is pushing up with that counteractive force. That's exactly what a scale does, and that is exactly the definition of, of uh, the normal force. The normal force acts perpendicular to a surface, and it is a counteracting uh, force. So it reads the scale, so at x you would read 700 newtons, and at y, 800 newtons. Now I know some students are going to say, wait a second, if, if, the, if the nurse picked up the bed and put it on a scale, won't that tip the bed and then you get different readings and different weights? Yeah, but look, if it, like I me, mean, first of all, that has to be a really big scale, right? You're going to have to have a scale that's somehow this big <laughs> or whatever so that the nurse puts one uh, bed on, uh, part of the bed on top of it. And then because it's at such an angle, uh, the other side weighs more, but we, we're not getting that data and we, we start getting uh, lower quantities. But why on earth would you use a huge scale to put, put a bed on? That's one issue. But the other issue is this. If it is a huge scale, uh, Acer is going to have to give us a little bit more data on that. I mean, it, because it's, it would be different if, if they said that the scale was only a, a, a couple of inches or a few centimeters. Um, from if they said that the scale was uh, was you know half a meter or or uh, or, or so on. So th this is a very very big difference. So um, right now I would have to say that uh, that uh, without further data, the more logical uh, choice is to say that uh, the scale has a negligible effect on on the on the actual process of uh, of weighing. So that's it for this question.